welcome. Today we're taming the cat, meow, meow. Um, I want to talk about tonight about how to deal with a sudden influx of public adjusting business. So I want to talk about two things, right? Well, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We always talk about a lot of things, right? I want to deal with how to get more business, how to prep yourself for a cat, right? And then I also want to talk about how to deal with it when you get slammed with these things, how to prioritize, how to pick through the clients, how to like, just how to do all of it. Right. Um, so that's what we're going to cover today. Our agenda, I always break it down to three major bullet points is how to create that first phone call list of clients, because obviously we have, you know, the weather, you know, we know what's coming, whether it hits us hard or it hits us a little softer, we know the general areas where big catastrophic events are coming or, you know, predicted to go through, even if it's not exact zip codes and things like that. But I want to talk to you about um, kind of pre-gaming the cat and figuring out and making that list of clients or prospects to contact. Then I want to talk a little bit about, well, maybe a lot about uh, creating a triage process specifically for cat events. How you deal with catastrophic events is, you know, all of a sudden people come out of the woodwork that they wouldn't normally think to put a claim in, but they know because of the storm, there's, you know, help to be had sort of thing, much more serious damage than what maybe happen on your dailies and things like that. Um, so I want to talk about a process and a lot of this is prep work for catastrophic events. It's not just starting to think about it, you know, as the storms are batting down on you. Um, this is why we're talking about it now. If I had thought about it, I would have actually made this webinar in June <laughs> so that we could cover this a lot easier, but you still have time. We've only had kind of one or two big major events in the U S so far, the one out in the Midwest and the one down in Florida and up the East coast. So we still have time. We're good. And then I want to talk to you how you can profit from claims that you can't take on yourself, right? So not everything we talk about is going to apply to every company or every person on this call or watching the video, but these are all really good ideas to be had to think forward on. Okay. A little bit about me, co-founder Claim Wizard. I am the Sorceress of Alchemy. I've passed my marketing and education title on to other people in my company I am a certified business advisor, not really a coach. I should change that with the fix this next uh, methodology, which we covered in last time's webinar, published books. I used to be a pro speaker before the earth was on fire. I obviously own a small business. I've been working with PA since 96, but dedicated in the past eight years. And that's about it on me. In case anybody's new here that hasn't been, and I'm seeing quite a few new names. Okay. First things first, first phone call list, right? So I want you to be able to know immediately if something rolls through, where do you start? Now, of course, let's think about this, right? So you're not going to um, have a, this is Lynette likes to switch on video every once in a while. You're not going to be talking about, okay, the, you know, catastrophic event roll through, power's out everywhere. We're on the, you know, Waffle House index is bad, the whole nine yards, right? So like, that's not the time to be calling these people. Obviously their phones probably don't work. They probably don't have power to charge things like not the time. We're going to be making lists to go to this before, oh my gosh, before disaster strikes. Cause you know, y'all got that on your website. So that's what we're going to be talking about how to do that. So with this, I want you to be able to find local contacts and contacts. My experience is obviously with Claim Wizard. So if you're not a Claim Wizard user, you should have a list someplace, whether it be an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets spreadsheet, whatever they call that, um, a CRM, you know, one of those free ones that they have out there that you could use that you can put basic client information in, and we call it NAEP, name, address, phone, email, right? That's the acronym for that. So somewhere along the lines in the course of you doing business, you have a contact list of clients. In Claim Wizard, there's actually a couple things that I wanted to point out for you, and you'll get all the slides for these, so don't worry about little tiny text. 
you can run a report depending on how many adjusters you have at your company. If you have two or three, obviously you probably have a roundabout area where they live, right? But if you have, you know, 20, 30 adjusters, you may want to see who exactly is in a specific area. And the reason why this is, is so the report name is adjusters in area and you can give a zip code, a radius, et cetera. Solicit to your neighbors. Like I'm going to help the people in my neighborhood first before growing, going across town and things like that. So it's just a familiar face. Your kids may play baseball together, all those sorts of things. They may go to the same school. So by getting adjusters that live in a specific area, I find that there's a much, a, a much faster connections to strangers can be made with that. Um, the next is kind of this little one. I wish my mouse pointer worked on this. I swirl it around like I do on my demos. Um, is a client mailing list. So if you go to Claim Wizard and take a look at the report section, when you type in the in the little search bar for the claim or for the for the report types, type in in area. You're going to get a lot of different reports on this. In fact, as I was building this webinar, I worked with our team and we added, or I should say, Lena asked and they added <laughs> a lot of additional fields to these lists, to these reports that will help you specifically during catastrophic events. So you need to do this ahead of time before the sky falls. Okay. So the client mailing list, and there is a client mailing list and a client email mailing list. I think there's two different things, but honestly, the client list mailing list gives you email, gives you physical address, that sort of thing. The email address, the email list we kind of made. So if you need to pop it into constant contact or MailChimp or something like that, it, it's kind of formatted a little bit better than that. But what I'm going to say is go in tonight, tomorrow, well before the cats hit, go to your client mailing list, run the report, export it into Excel, whatever. Sometimes it's easier to open. But the areas that I'm going to ask that you pay attention to is your client zip code, right? So if you have clients all over Florida and, you know, Miami gets hit, panhandle, not so much. Sort them out by zip code. Once, you, If you sort them numerically, you're going to start getting to the chunks of zip codes that belong to Miami. So, you know, you can kind of concentrate on those and things like that. You're also going to see a column that says open, settled, or canceled. Open is pretty obvious. It's an active claim. Um, so you definitely want to contact these people if you know their roof is currently being, you know, blue tarped and they're going to have subsequent damage, things like that. Um, settled is, is positive, I guess, positively settled in a good way. And canceled can be for a number of reasons, but you may not necessarily want to contact canceled people, or maybe you do, maybe there was insufficient coverage, insufficient damage, but somehow you have a relationship with them. So at least you can kind of categorize them. We have also added in most recent, well, this has been maybe a month or two, most recent loss date. So if you deal with clients where they've given you multiple claims over the years, you're going to see their most recent loss date. Obviously, if they had a re most recent loss date of 2010, that's a pretty cold relationship. But if it's like now or last week or even last year, that's a much warmer relationship. Um, most recent contact as well is kind of a good thing for that. Um, type commercial residential. So we'll give you those tags in there. So if you're going after, you know, sort by commercial, those are, you know, bigger loss kind of things. So these are areas that I would pay attention to on your spreadsheet here to make sure that you can kind of group people together and maybe do specific email lists or even mail lists, uh, mail outreaches to all your commercial clients because how you're going to talk to them is going to be different than how you're going to deal with residential clients. You know, um, zip codes for areas, maybe a lot of them are landlocked versus on the water type of thing. Reach out and warm those relationships up before the catastrophic event. Okay. So what, what I had my guys add to this uh, client mailing list is there's three additional columns now. When you go into your client record, not the claim itself, but your client in there, additionally to their name, right? Their name, address, phone, email, there is a reference rating. It's one through five stars. So if they're 
not going to be a good reference for you because they happen to be, they were very combative with you. They never returned what they were supposed to. They never signed contracts on time. They didn't pay you on time, whatever the things are, right? You give them a rating of a one or a two star. If they're great reference for you, four or five stars, there is a status button, say active use. I forget what it says, but it basically lets you say, are they an active referral? Like, can you send people to them? Can you put them on the, because we have a referral list now or a, a client referral list that you can print and things like that. And then any notes. So you may have a note to say, you know, only, con you know, only contact nights and weekends or please call client before giving out their name or something along those lines, right? So now you're going to know that. So if you have people in a specific area that you know are good referral sources for you or good testimonials for you, you're going to see that grouped right in with the zip code on there on that spreadsheet. So when you're looking in a neighborhood, you're going to have, you know, a great referral um, source a couple blocks away or wherever from that, those people that you're actively trying to warm up again. So this is kind of the pre-flight checklist, right? So I would like you to go through, no matter how you store your data, go through reports of names and addresses and zip codes, make, you know, that kind of thing, fill in the incomplete information. Um, Dave and the guys here have also been working on uh, reports that uh, if you're m missing certain key information in claims, like say you're missing the uh, carrier claim number, like that's a big one. You need that. Um, that's not for this because we're just talking clients here. And for us, clients and claims are separate entities. But make sure you don't have any missing information because if you have to sit there while the weather's going crazy and try to find zip codes or accurate phone numbers for people, that's that's too late at that point. Next, I want you to reach out to them before any major expected weather event. And chances are you have something, um, and we'll talk about this in a bit, a leave behind, maybe a one sheet or something that says how to prepare for a hurricane or um, how to check for hail damage or some kind of leave behind where they can kind of help themselves, how to, how to check for damage on uh, brick siding versus vinyl siding, whatever those things are, your area of expertise. If not, take the time now, make it up right? So that you have something to, to, a reason to contact them to say, Hey, I know we did business in the past. There's a big storm coming through. I have a really good checklist that might help you prepare. That's great. You know, roll in your smoker from outside. So it doesn't become a projectile type thing. Like whatever it is that you come up with, come it up, come up with it, brand it, make it a PDF. You can email, put it as a PDF on your website, whatever you're going to do door hang it. I don't care how you get it out to them, but this is your touch point that you can reach to them before. If I always use Florida, I love you guys. You're, you're my guinea pigs as Florida goes. So does the rest of the public adjusting industry, I say, um, but maybe the storm's going to hit the West coast, the Gulf and not the East. So why bother sending stuff? I mean, you always want to reach out to them, but we're talking about immediate things that you can do to prepare for cats. Um, the other thing that I want you to do, oh my gosh, is check for the expiration dates of your adjuster's licenses. In Claim Wizard, they just rolled out a place. I, it's under the star icon for your staff in each staff record. If they're an assignable user, like an adjuster, an estimator, there is a spot in there for their license and their bonds. You could put it per state, however you break it down. So if they have licenses in six states, start end date, bonds, license number, the whole thing. Um, when Hurricane Michael rolled through, no, not Michael, the big one in, in, in Houston we had like three years ago, um, I had a public adjuster from the Northeast call me from the plane to ask me something about claim wizard. Like, I was like, what? He's like, I'm like, where are you? He's like, I'm in, I'm on the plane. I'm coming to Texas. And he's a friend. And I was like, have, is your license still valid here? I looked it up for him. I'm like, you might as well just get on the plane, turn around and go right back on the next plane because you let your, your license expire in Texas like three years ago. So he couldn't do business here. So make sure that wherever you're going to go, your licenses are valid because you're going to get a smack on a hand. Um, funny story at my friend's expense. I do adore him, but it just goes to show that especially when you're juggling a lot of states, those things can run out of date very quickly without you realizing it. 
So make sure your license is valid in whatever state, you know, those cats are rolling through. Florida folks never seem to get licensed outside of Florida because what the heck's the need? But other states definitely jump states. So that's something to keep an eye on. Okay. Now I want to talk about the triage process. And triage in medical terms is basically your ER, your emergency room. I should have looked this up. I used to know it. Um, but there's a process that they go through to make sure that they are ready to take emergencies. And then the process of triaging is quickly and systematically going through a process to make sure that, you know, is it life-threatening? Is it, you know, debilitating? Whatever those things are, a heart attack obviously has precedence over like, you know, sprained thumb kind of thing. So you have to be able to look at something and quickly assess what, what bucket it belongs into, how much attention you should be giving something and what type of attention you should be giving something in immediate beginning terms. So for me, again, Lynette has a lot of stories. Um, I want you to think about these three things. I want you to think about before, during, and after a cat, right? So we talked about making sure your client list is solid and, con and you've contacted and reached these people. But before, during, and after for, for triaging, and we're going to talk about your setup, your intake forms, and your process. You would be surprised, folks, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised. I, I feel like I want to put my video on, but there's a lot of bullet points on the screen. So just imagine me looking a little shocked and, and concerned here. Um, clean your car. You, not the same, but you know how many real estate agents' cars for over the past couple of years we've bought places, moved, rented, whatever, and I've been in their cars and they're disgusting. Like, oh, no, clean your car. People look in your car. Make sure you get gas because in a big cat, you may not be able to get it. Get an oil change, that sort of thing. Get your car washed, whatever. I don't want to see you pulling up in an old jalopy because it does not really instill faith in me as a consumer. I want you to stock up on your business cards, your flyers, your one sheets are those kind of, you know, here's what to do. Like immediate, if, if there's whatever damage in your house, like immediately go shut off your gas line or your water line or, you know, whatever those things are that you tell people when you come to, you know, inspect damage or whatever. And then any kind of leave behinds, and this is up to you, but I've seen leave behinds. And of course it depends on, not to sound crass about this, but it depends on the, the extent of the damage and the worth of the damage and the, I guess the type of building and things like that. Um, if you, in a non-cat situation, if you go to a building and there's like two carpet tiles have bleach on them, like that's not a high value claim. I mean, it's probably not a claim, but it's not a high value claim. I wouldn't go leaving a customized, you know, laptop sleeve or, or or jacket or like, I wouldn't like, don't make the leave behinds really big. But if you walk into a home and it's, you know, a big thing, leave behinds that work really well. So it's kind of swag, but specific, I guess. So really good leave behinds for, um, for cat events. I've actually found are some of the good things that people give away at conferences. Those little, I don't have any here, of course, uh, little mini USB chargers, because if you watch people online when they are going through power losses, um, their water doesn't work, or they have well water and no electric and the pump doesn't work, whatever the scenario, right? Their, their freezer's done. Um, you're not going to roll up with a big old, you know, uh, Mitsubishi, you know, built in, you know, generator and stuff like that. But you can leave crank uh, flashlights with your logo on them. You can leave um, little USB chargers, you know, think about things, water bottles, even just bring them a case of water or a six pack of water or something. Um, put your sticker on it, whatever, just a kind thing that you can leave behind to someone that will help them during a catastrophic event. Um, a beer koozie, maybe not so much, maybe, but think about something along the lines that may actually apply in that particular situation. Again, I wouldn't go giving away like a $50 thing if it's two carpet tiles kind of thing. So you make your own personal judgment on that. Um, 
I want you to think about making a public adjuster pack for your guys because I even see people, you know, vendors and stuff come to my house um, that don't have some of the basics that they need to do their job because they switched vehicles or they accidentally left it at the old client's house or something like those. I want you to think about having extra, or even maybe this, they have, you can get like, I don't know, six foot little plastic measuring tapes. Um, maybe get those with your logo and leave them behind so like they could, your clients could measure things. I don't know, but your measuring tapes, your measuring devices, your uh, laser uh, measuring devices, your safety equipment. And this, you know, I'm talking about like goggles, hard hats, whatever those, you know, knee pads, whatever those things are that you would need if you were going through a home that, you know, had sufficient damage. Your PPE, of course, now we all need it. Um, you know, so gloves, uh, masks, things like that. Plus, I want you to have a stack of intake forms and a stack of contracts. So all those things maybe get, now is college time. So, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond and Target have all those little collapsible crates. I say get one of those collapsible crates and make sure it's always filled. And if you have a large enough office, maybe, you know, bring it in, somebody refills it for your adjuster, and then they put it back in their car kind of thing. Same goes with prepping your phone and your camera. I've seen people go out and their memory card is full, their phone is full, they can't take any more pictures. Um, I personally like having a separate camera with memory cards, you know, those little micro USB things uh, for adjusters to take photos, not necessarily on their personal phone. I've heard too many stories of attorneys wanting to have the actual phone of the adjuster for photos for whatever purpose, because they took work pictures with their personal phone and now their phone is kind of getting commandeered. So I personally think there should be a hard, hard line between church and state, get a camera, and then you can swap out memory cards, have extras to go, that sort of thing. Definitely double check your chargers, your devices, your cords, your portable USB batteries. For example, in my car yesterday, the one cord that I had to charge my phone flaked out and then my phone died. I could, you know, like, for, for a $10 cord, it was stupid. Check all that stuff. And then last is consult with your home office or yourself or your admin or whatever for the best procedures to follow when we get to the next part, right? So if you don't know what your office needs as an adjuster or as a sales solicitor so they can onboard claims quickly, it causes a lot of extra time and there's really nothing worse in the beginning of a client's relationship with you than to have to keep calling or emailing. Well, can you get me this? Or what about that? It's like, can't you, it's like signing going for a mortgage, right? It seems like you're on closing day and everything pops out of the woodwork. You need all these extra forms. Make sure that when you go and you meet with these prospects or get the contract signed and the now clients, Everything your office needs from you to get in that first visit is done. So they don't have to keep calling their client because you look sloppy and uncoordinated. So your intake forms, this is a real basic one. It's just a PDF, or I think it's a word file I have. And I just have a client intake form, especially when you have a cat event. I honestly have seen that writing things on paper is a little bit easier than opening up your laptop and starting a new claim right then and there. Um, it, it's just a lot quicker. People are going to be just jumping around and giving you bits and pieces of information out of order. Um, so, and some of it is pretty obvious to you, property type, you know, is it a commercial building? Is it a condo? Like those are obvious things you don't need to answer. You can kind of do that when you walk away, but having an intake form so that your main office has every originating piece of information they need. We know you're not going to have declaration pages. We know you're not going to, maybe you'll take pictures, but we know you're not going to have policy, right? Who, who's there with a, with a broken roof that has their actual policy in their hand? That actually you should be telling your clients ahead of time, make sure they contact their broker, get the most, uh, you know, up-to-date version of their policy, declaration page, make, you know, updates if they need it, that sort of thing. Um, but also with this intake form, maybe on the other side, there should be a checklist of what your main office wants you to get. Even if you can't get it right then and there, maybe you, you did get it. 
um, maybe they did have the declaration page or they did have a copy of their contract or something like that. So you're going to want to be able to include that so it saves time later. Um, so whatever that process is that your home office wants, you follow it. <laughs> Trust me on that. So I've done a lot of webinars that talk about process. I do a lot of training that talks about process and onboarding and all of these things, but all of that knowledge is finally coming together into one place. And I'm going to ask you that specifically for a catastrophic event, maybe you even have a separate one, welcome letters. So when you get a client, you can actually have a version, an uncustomized version of a welcome letter or like how this procedure is going to work, your public adjuster and you, and leave it to them. When they sign the contract and you give them a copy, leave them a copy of this welcome letter that has, this is what we're going to ask you for. This is generally how the process goes. I can send you guys that too if you don't have it. I'm pretty sure it's up on the Claim Wizard site. But I definitely want an email or a phone call. Ask your clients. It's on that sheet, what their preferred method of contact is. Maybe they want you to email them because their you know, phone service is spotty or whatever, or maybe they want a phone call because they can't get access to their email anymore. Whatever the deal is, mark it down within 48 hours or before that contract has the ability to be canceled. I want you to contact somebody in your office, not the public adjuster, unless you're the only you know, teammate on your team, I want you to contact them within 48 hours, ask them how they are, you know, did they find a place to live, whatever the deal is, it is a touch base, you need to contact them. You also need to set up bi-weekly, and I mean every other week, calls and emails once you're in the thick of the process of it. Um, when people are in those situations, and you know this, and I know this from personal friends of mine that you know, I'm like, go hire a public adjuster. They're going to do it for you. And then they're like, I haven't heard from my PA in seven weeks and I still don't have a roof. Like ding, 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 not good. Don't do it. What I suggest, even if you only have one receptionist or you have one spouse, hopefully you only have one spouse that works with you, that does all of the things anyway, I want you to dedicate someone as a care specialist a claims care specialist or something, give it a cute name or an important name. And when you reach out to the clients, because I'm going to tell you the adjusters are going to be a protected entity from now on, right? In a cat, adjusters are the golden goose. You must protect the golden goose. You kill that goose too early trying to get a hold of that next golden egg to guess what? He don't lay any more eggs. She doesn't lay any more eggs. You have to protect the golden goose. And in a catastrophic situation, your adjusters and or your solicitors are your golden geese. Ha don't have them returning phone calls to clients. To, like, yes, you can, you know, obviously that's part of it, but there should you guys should be working as a team. Have your care specialist be the person that reaches out to your clients. How are you doing? Whatever, especially experience, you guys know it. If you're dealing with senior citizens, elderly people, you know, anything like that, they will chew your ear off, love them to death. They will chew your ear off and tell you about every little paint thing that they saw on their wall in some big story, and they will chew up your time. You need to take care of your clients, but your adjusters don't need to be sitting on the phone for 48 minutes having those conversations necessarily. So how can we profit from claims you can't take on yourself? That's a good question in regular life, let alone catastrophic events. But there are times when more is going to come at you than you know what to do with. So here's some ideas to profit from. These could be for what I call blue skies, right? So I call it blue sky marketing for public adjusters. When there's no cats falling from the sky, what do you do for your dailies? What do you do when there's not sinkholes popping up all over or, you know, the, you know, ocean decides to come three blocks into the, to the shore? Um, these are some ideas that are basic business building anyway. Some of them are more temporary though, um, definitely. So mutual referrals. I see this, I talked to a company today I talk to companies every day and 
a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this more and more, which is I'm like, well, how do you market? How do you advertise? They're like, it's all word of mouth. I'm like, you don't do anything. They're like, we do nothing. They get business from other clients. They treat those clients, right. They keep in touch with them and they get more business. <laughs> so the majority of people have to go out and actually solicit in some capacity, even if it's a warm, you know, connection and things like that. Um, so mutual referrals, even if you're, if, if you have a client that's giving you word of mouth, a, a secondary person, that person they're referring to you may not be a right fit for your company, have some place you can give them because what's going to happen if I refer my cousin to you and you are like, I can't help her. Well, that's going to leave a bad taste in my mouth and I'm not referring anybody else to you. But if my cousin says, well, they couldn't help me, but they gave me another great company that could, yep, that relationship is still good. So you definitely have to think about that. Then I want to talk about temporary adjuster hires because I see this and normally when I go to the FAPIA events, um, I see solo public adjusters uh, and they're like, where can I meet people that I could like get work from and kind of do work for And I'm like, go to the bar, <laughs> go to FAPIA, go to the bar. It's how, how the networking works, but there's ways to do that now since we're all COVID bound and then grow your back end office. And I'm going to tell you specifically with those two, why one might work better for your company versus the other. Okay. So mutual referrals, develop a symbiotic relationship, right? I just, I feel like I won the corporate bingo by using symbiotic relationship. Um, so what I want you to do is uh, you, where I grew up, so to speak, in public adjusting in the Northeast is, is everybody has their ecosystems of, uh, if you tell me how your business is run, I can generally tell you what area of the country you're in. Um, so there was always not a lot of good blood between public adjusters in the Northeast. I see, you know, I know that can happen everywhere. You know, if a person's a jerk, they're a jerk. But Florida, I see a lot of relationships. I see a lot of relationships in Texas, in California, in Chicago, um, Canada, <laughs> surprising or not. Um, so find those firms that that don't do exactly what you do. Now, if you're a jack of all trades public adjuster and you'll take anything from, you know, two tile carpet bleach stain to a multi um, warehouse building burned to the ground, that's, that's great. That's great for you. <laughs> Just say that. Most public adjusters that I see um, have some sort of specialty. Maybe they come from a roofing background or they come from a remediation background or they are a GC. Whatever your thing is, maybe you're really good with residential, but when you get those large loss, you know, um, commercial claims, it's a bit more than you could probably bite off and handle. Um, develop, find a company that you can work with that you can kind of swap things. Set a referral fee. It's nice to do it because you're, it's nice to do it. But in this type of situation, I really think you should all have some skin in the game. Um, put a finder's fee or a referral fee if it is legal in your state. I actually don't know in all these years of working. Um, I know it happens. I don't know if it's legal. So I'll just leave you with that. Go talk to your attorney on that because I honestly don't know, although it does happen um, quite often. Set a referral fee, not BNI. If you send me two, I'm going to send you two. And I'm going to hold back until you send me more. Like none of that business, like have a good relationship with somebody. And even if you, you know, you might want to be able to call them up and say, Hey, I had this thing happen. I've got this potential client. What do you think? And, you know, just somebody to kind of bounce things off of. But what that's going to do is it's going to keep your company in good emotional standing with your prospects it's still going to make you money and then you're not going to do the work. You're going to refer it to somebody else that can handle that better than you. So next up is temporary adjuster hires. This happens quite often. I see license counts for companies go up during cats and then they scale back down in claim wizard when the season is over. If you can, I believe I love office staff. You know, I, you know, I love you, but in a cat situation, adjusters with licenses are the golden goose. If you have more business than you think you can take on, go through your CRM or Rolodex or whatever, and find some of those solo public adjuster guys that do work on their own and they're great. You know, maybe they have a license and they do something else on the side and they work when they have to 
bring them on and ask them and rekindle that conversation in that relationship before the cats go through and say, Hey, listen, I'm, I'm, if cats come through, I, I always get a big load. You know, are you still in the game? Would you like to work? How many claims can you handle? How many claims can I rely on you to be able to handle? So maybe you gather yourself a bunch of public adjusters. One says, oh, I could take 10. One says I could take 15, whatever the deal is. Um, you know, so you kind of know, well, all right, well, I have all these extra public adjusters that'll work for me ad hoc or per diem when I need to. And if I add up their numbers, I know I can, I can easily handle 85 more claims. Well, that's perfect for you because you're doing the, the back end processing that should be in place. If you're a solo public adjuster, this is probably not the best idea for you because they're going to look to you for the back end office work. That's the trade-off that you're doing. You're providing that sort of thing. Um, definitely think about outsourcing your estimates. That is one of the most time consuming detail oriented pieces of running a claim. If you find companies and all they do is exactimate, if all they do is estimating, it may be worth your time to be able to take a higher caseload if you can outsource your estimates. So you have to balance how much is that estimate going to cost me versus how many more claims can I take on because I have more time to deal with more claims. So that's going to be something that you're going to have to look at based on your own experience. And then, of course, I said there are a lot of solo public adjusters. They don't want to run the overhead of the business. They don't want, I'll be honest, they don't want to make the, you know, feel good customer service calls. They don't want to check in. They just want to go in. They want to rip apart the carpet. They want to jump on the roof. They want to take pictures, measurements, do an estimate, and be out of there. Hire them. If you've got more business than you can deal with, hire them. They will work for you. It's, it's a great deal. When the cat's done, they go off doing whatever they were doing before. So one of my favorite things to do is to grow your back office. Let's assume you have three public adjusters and one admin. She answers the phone. She does the mail for you. She calls you and lets you know when a client called, whatever the deal is. Public adjusters during cats are your golden goose. Do not let your adjusters set their own appointments, do their own follow-ups. Public adjusters, especially during a cat, see here comes a video again, Lynette, especially during a cat should only be, in my opinion, only be doing work that is required by their license, soliciting and adjusting. Farm out. You can farm out estimates, but maybe you're got maybe you've got bang up guys that are adjusters that do great estimates. Let them do that, um, and outsource ev or insource everything else to your staff. Maybe you hire extra people to work in your office to answer the phone all day, or to make follow up calls, or to um, scan checks or something like that. So this is where. I'm going to skip ahead. So where it says the $1, the $10, the $100 work, there's a webinar for that. I will link it on YouTube and put it all below and whatever I have to do. But your adjusters are the $100 work. Your office staff may be $10 or $1. And I said in the webinar, it's not an actual value of person because everybody has their own personal $100 work. So answering phones and doing checks and all that other stuff is the office admin's $100 work. That's her core. Adjusting is the adjuster's $100 work. But when you're looking at catastrophic events, your adjuster is the $100 work. If you can get your adjuster to go out and make more $100 while you're paying office $10, like you're obviously it cuts out better, right? So I want you to get those adjusters should never be in the office except for to restock stuff or to drop things off. There's no office days. There's no them running their own paperwork. Adjusters should not be generating their proof of losses. They should not be generating welcome letters. They should not be calling and sitting on the phone for two hours with the carrier trying to get a claim number. My eye is twitching just thinking about it. Hire someone. It's not that difficult to teach somebody how to call a carrier. This is my number. This is my client. What's your, what's your claim number? It's not difficult to do. Your adjusters during a cat need to be out, out, out all the time. So that's where I'm saying grow your back end office because with three adjusters and one admin in the office, those guys take 
every piece of work away from them, except for the actual bare minimum of soliciting, getting that contract signed and adjusting the claim, hire three more people for in the office, your adjusters, I promise you can go out and get double, triple the work and work it because they have less to do with more claims and offload that other work into your office staff. It works in a normal time, but if that's not your normal structure and you want to be able to handle more claims during a cat, that may be the structure that you have to follow. And I will tell you, even though it's a second bullet point here, please, during a catastrophic event, make sure that a human being that understands, even on a very basic primal level, your business answers the phone. Do not have your, I know people have their cell phones on their business cards and things like that. And that may be their only office phone. Forward it something to someone. Leave your phone at home, get a burner for on the road, have your wife or your husband or whoever's home answer the phone for you. I don't ever think during a catastrophic event that it should go to voicemail or it should go to a generic call center. Um, the call centers, you can hear everybody in the background. You know it's baloney. They don't, they're just taking messages. That doesn't make me, it actually offends me more, to be honest with you. Or what's your name? And then they put you on hold while they call the real person and see if I'm worthy enough for you to talk to. That's got to go. A human being has to answer your phone in catastrophic events. If it's your cell phone and it's in your truck when you're in with a client and you don't answer, guess what? They're going to call the next adjuster on their list. I don't care if they have one of your one sheets or not. They want to talk to a person right then and there. Have somebody on the phone that can answer them. They're not going to be able to answer, well, how much money do you think I can get for this? But they can be a sympathetic ear. They can take down information. They can gauge the, um, the only word that's coming to mind right now is desperation. They can gauge the severity or the desperation of the person. Are they panicky? Is there water running through? Is there live electric lines? Or did they just happen to notice damage three weeks after or something? Like the person on a phone is going to be able to gauge that way better than a call center, than a voicemail or a write-in form on the internet because you're not getting that person's emotional status from that absolutely have a person, a real person answer your phone during a cat. 